Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I uh, um, would like to thank the GTFCC for inviting us to uh, listen to the discussion and uh, also an, for an opportunity to be able to share some of our perspectives uh, from the African Society for Laboratory Medicine. Um, so, yeah, I have a couple of slides. Uh, I'm hoping that I can take um, a few um, uh, minutes uh, to talk about this. So I'll skim through the first few slides, uh, also cognizant of time. Um, and I might say, when I listened to the uh, talk for, for partly from yesterday and uh, some of them today, I'm glad, I think we feel there is something that has already started happening uh, uh, with regards to some of the comments that we're coming through. I hope you can all see my slides. We can, thank you. Thank you, yes. So, um, uh, just a quick uh, overview of what ASLM is for those that may be hearing uh, this for the first time. We are the African Society for Laboratory Medicine. Uh, we stand to, uh, our work is all about us reaching a healthier Africa through access to quality laboratory services for all. And we hope to be able to do this by enabling and empowering national stakeholders to enhance the laboratory profession, its practice, uh, science, and, and, and networks. And uh, we feel we are better placed to set the agenda for laboratory medicine and uh, in our diverse nature, we, where we treat everyone uh, like a family, uh, we are always striving for improvements and we are committed to Africa as uh, progress. And uh, we have worked with many relatively young organizations, but we have worked with many global partners. Uh, and we see ourselves as a local and Africa-based partner uh, for many that like to take sustainable uh, projects uh, and, and, and interventions moving forward. We have just recently completed our strategic plan, uh, which has those four core strategic priorities. And I must say, uh, within today's discussion, uh, I think the, the elements to do with education, training, and knowledge, and also within the networks and laboratory system strengthening uh, uh, stand out within our strategy and it is really speaks to our what we need to do moving forward. So we are glad to be part of the team. Uh, as well as the innovations that were being discussed, both technological as well as um, uh, programmatic uh, innovations. So within the first strategic area uh, where we are where we are really claiming claiming uh, to to want to create that large pool of competent laboratory professionals. And uh, we have our ASLM Academy that we'll, I will talk about that we have uh, developed and we uh, have already started offering uh, some of the courses uh, in, the, in the manner in which I think one of the previous speakers spoke about. Uh, I think it was from Afghanistan. Um, and obviously, uh, I think a lot can be done within the context of cholera. Uh, we initially started as an HIV-centric organization, but we have uh, broadened to include stronger laboratory networks and uh, so, so that we are benefiting multiple diseases. And we have now gone into bacteriology, as I will also uh, mention. And we continue to develop quite a number of tools uh, that uh, uh, are strengthening uh, lab systems. So to talk about training, uh, our training is housed largely around the SLM Academy, which was launched uh, in March, 2020. This is basically uh, targeting in-service training, uh, which we feel 
and I think everybody might agree that it's a very popular intervention uh, uh, to address the shortage and in terms of numbers and in terms of skills for human resources for health. But the fact that this has been always happening, I think something probably means it's not working well. Uh, there could be many reasons. Um, we feel some of it could be maybe we are working in an environment where we don't have clear staffing norms and targets. Um, sometimes what we are training is not always complying with standards of educational safety uh, quality. And um, I, I think the previous speaker spoke about are we able to evaluate the effectiveness of what we are doing? It's not always clear. So sometimes there is that uncertainty in terms of the effectiveness of what we are doing in terms of developing the knowledge and the skills. And uh, everything that we do, uh, does it provide some benefit to the individual itself? Maybe we have not formalized certain credentials enough. So we developed this structure to infrastructure to deliver the trainings, uh, bring in a little bit of value to what we are doing in terms of training, developing credentials and micro credentials, professional registrations, uh, and obviously continuous uh, monitoring of workforce developments where we also issue certificates and CD, CPD points. So we have many of these packages now working. We have a steering and advisory committee that uh, looks at content that comes through, uh, the credentials, of course. And uh, we uh, have our learning management system powered by Moodle. Uh, and uh, we're working with quite a number of national professional authorities in, in the work that we do. Um, so within the context of much of the trainings that we do, uh, of course, we have various stages where sometimes it's just the proof of presence and we give a certificate of attendance. The pre and post test, I think, which was spoken earlier uh, by the previous speaker is also another one. We have also started offering um, some courses which are get a little bit more rigorous and we do offer a professional exam uh, which is centralized uh, around certain competence tasks uh, BMR, uh, NGS uh, uh, as well and uh, we are hoping that we in the end we will partner with renowned institutions to actually offer some formal certification uh delivered to indicate uh proficiency and all these are associated with uh some cpd acknowledgement so just in terms of numbers uh we we do have uh some traction moving on uh over uh, six thousand participants that have already uh passed through here five of our, our courses are accredited by uh the vids health consortium and the european Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical e Education. And we have and continue to en engage many of the professional regulatory associations within the countries for them to be able to recognize uh, some of the people that go through this academy uh, within their countries. And in terms of numbers, uh, I think you, this I have spoken to, to this uh, slide. But uh, just to give uh, those that usually have proof of uh, presence, our webinars, conferences, we do have courses on COVID, a lot of uh, COVID-19 RDT, uh, quality management systems, biosafety lab networks, next generation sequencing uh, that have that component uh, where people are actually evaluated formally. And uh, we have done a centralized exam for our work in AMR surveillance, both for the epidemiology and laboratory tracks, and we are yet to get the last bit. I must say, uh, we are proud to say much of this work has gone beyond the continent, as we initially um, uh, 
uh, sort of targeted. So it looks like it's gaining traction. So what are the opportunities with today's discussion? Uh, uh, where can we, uh, I think one of the requests was, is there, are there any opportunities where we can work together and collaborate? I think the first one that comes to mind is the work that we are doing uh, on qualifying the workforce for MRS surveillance in Africa and Asia. Um, and this is a UK Fleming funded project. Um, so this kind of answers what the gentleman from Afghanistan mentioned. Sometimes we don't need only the one off trainings, but can we create something sustainable and sustained? So this is an 18 to 24 months uh, course, uh, which targets uh, human resources largely from the national and, and, and sentinel sites. And they there are two tracks, the microbiology one and the epidemiology one, and it has two levels. You have the skilled level, those that are capable of just performing laboratory tasks. Uh, and then uh, those that are capable of designing and, and managing uh, uh, our systems for MRS surveillance, be it from the lab side or from the AP side. We have also introduced a master trainer element to this to create a card that is capable of um, capable of uh, delivering content to fellow colleagues, uh, maybe with a, with, a, with a view of rolling out this at national level, because we are taking this from a regional perspective. Uh, and this course is accompanied by a mentorship phase, uh, six months of those that would have qualified. Uh, we have trained about uh, 300 plus, 200 have professionally qualified and we have about 58 master trainers. So within that curriculum, uh, maybe if I can come back, I think you would see that the module three, like bacteriology uh, and, and some of those advanced techniques would, uh, would, would possibly find common uh, uh, elements with uh, the, the today's discussions. I uh, want to mention these courses are offered, um, they, ha they, they have an online component where people prepare alone and then uh, they meet face to face uh, uh, and then after completing the set number uh, of successfully completing the set number of modules they are eligible to sit for the professional exam and they are professionally registered at the SLM Academy uh, which is a continental register uh, of competence uh, and, and they are supposed to maintain this over a period of uh, two to three years. So can we leverage some of the content uh, which we have here? Um, I just picked out a few from the microbiology side where you have these face-to-face -face modules on bacteriology testing for human and animal health. Uh, we focus initially on the uh, glass pathogens uh, and uh, we, we are looking at capabilities and people actually do theoretical and practical lessons uh, of how to do the microscopy culture, the biochemical tests that comes with it, uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing, um, and, and, and a lot more. Um, we also have advanced modules like uh, the module six, where they actually do use of the novel technology such as whole genome sequencing and MAUDITOF to um, apply some of these uh, uh, techniques that they have learned. Uh, and I'm, like I've mentioned, we have now 200 that went through this course and um, uh, 120 have been professionally qualified by a professional exam and a PA on a register. Uh, we are saying this demonstrates knowledge of and skill to do this key and defined tasks that are there and provides that level of public confidence that people are capable. They've been tested uh, across uh, many um, uh, fields and across the, 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 the continent. Uh, and it's also a demonstration of the individual's commitment to maintain that skill um, because we, for them to renew that, they need to uh, 
show evidence of continuous uh, improvement. Like I said, that continues. We also have, I think, another opportunity. Uh, this was, was also some kind of discussed yesterday. Uh, you know, ISLM is the implementing partner with the Party Journalist Initiative uh, for the Africa CDC. And uh, within this, uh, the, the PGI is looking to expand the, uh, you know, the use of NGS to other pathogens of priority. And such discussions have been held. Uh, I think for examples from Ghana, uh, can we take advantage of this? And, and, uh, and uh, one example is from Malawi, where we supported the Public Health Institute of Malawi to conduct sequencing uh, to identify cholera in the recent outbreak and uh, training of the staff on genomic sequencing and bioinformatics. So that's another one. Um, we also think there is also a potential to collaborate further. Uh, one of the initiatives that we are doing within the ASLM is uh, what we call the lab mapping. Uh, and here we simply collect data, the GPS coordinates uh, of facilities, uh, and 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 collect quite quite a lot in terms of laboratory capability, uh, including QMS, AMR, and, and 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 stuff like that. But what would be uh, also interesting is within the data collection we actually collect uh, information on cholera. What are the uh, diagnostics that are available there? Uh, so you would actually see that they, we, we, we have collected uh, some information on whether there's microscopy, uh, what, what exactly they are, they are doing. And this is in addition to a whole lot of other diagnostics, of course, and uh, we, we, further analyze this data uh, in terms of uh, based on what the priorities of the country is. And uh, within there, we are able to tell uh, where are the gaps mm -hmm. and which countries uh, still have to prioritize. And I think this information, I, I believe, can be pulled particularly for bacteriology and where maybe the, our discussion today falls. And we maybe can have a, a, a starting point. Uh, these are probably older numbers, but I think we have over 2,000 labs that have been mapped uh, in many of these, um, talking about higher tier labs. So based on this, uh, I think yesterday we, we, we talked about uh, the potential to look at where, where some of this is. So I think within this data, we are capable of telling uh, the capability at, at tier levels. Um, and uh, I think based on what we find, if I, this one is actually using uh, a different test, but uh, I think based, we could actually apply the same uh, uh, principles to say where we find, say, bacteriology testing, uh, what would we need to do to at least increase uh, coverage to testing by uh, moving uh, certain or applying certain diagnostics to certain areas uh, and it just kind of uses most of the time that Pareto uh, principle. Within our other uh, work on uh, EQA and uh, quality management systems for bacteriology, uh, which is happening under our flagship EQA Africa, uh, this is a deliberate um, effort to try and strengthen bacteriology, again, funded uh, via the Fleming Fund. Uh, we know much of the EQA has been happening largely through HIV, TB uh, programs, but this has sort of zoned down to bacteriology and AMR. Uh, I feel this is a potential area where we could also, uh, I think, tackle some of the issues that we've discussed. Uh, we have seen quite a number of labs being strengthened across the One Health for QMS within the bacteriology scope. Uh, and, and some of them have undergone our uh, flagship uh, stepwise laboratory improvement 
um, program towards accreditation, which is usually known as, as SLIPTA. So I think these are some of the um, initiatives that we feel, uh, uh, in, in addition to training, uh, I think we can use this to determine where exactly training is required and where we we need to, uh, I think, strengthen both the training side as well as uh, what exactly are we targeting the right the right uh, fields. I think let me stop here uh, and uh, we are glad to have been invited to discuss this and really looking forward to working together to see if we can do uh, a few more. Thanks.